Okay, we are back for our next session on um, extracellular RNA and RNA binding proteins. Um, you may notice um, that today we have a fair number of talks that uh, the, the biological foundation is not extracellular RNA and, and we're doing that because we need that as a foundation for work in our field. And the same is true of our next speaker. Um, we have Eric Van Nostrand from the Baylor College of Medicine here to talk about um, the ENCODE RNA binding protein project um, where they have done quite a lot of work um, finding um, RNA protein interactions in cells and we can use that as a basis for finding the same thing um, extracellularly. Thank you very much for the invitation to come to come tell you guys about um, the ENCODE project work and it's been a lot of fun you know I'm not usually exposed to, to as much extracellular RNA stuff and so it's it's been really neat to, to hear what what you all have been working on and and learn some interesting things about about that system um, so yeah so before I get started um, I just want to as a disclosure I'm co-founder of a company that is making kits and services um, with some of the RNA genomic stuff that that we developed it during my postdoc, um, but all the work I'm going to talk about today is academic work, largely done it when I was a postdoc um, at UCSD. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. So, as very brief background, um, so I, I cut a lot of the background that I usually give about how important RNA processing is because I figure this audience doesn't need that. Um, but for for us, the the key thing was you know we're really interested in how all of these steps of RNA processing that occur in the cell are regulated by RNA binding proteins. Um, so every step of RNA processing, there's all these different you know in this figure these ovals, right? These are RNA binding proteins that that sometimes recognize specific primary sequence motifs, sometimes recognize structural elements, um, some recognize a mix of both, right? But um, recent, effort, uh, recent estimates from either computational efforts to predict RNA binding domains or just experiments where people pull down, you know, polyadenylated RNA and then mass spec everything that comes down with it have suggested that there's over 1,500 RNA binding proteins in human. And these RNA binding proteins, you know, interact with RNA to control, you know, when alternative splicing, you know, when exons are included or excluded, how RNAs are exported from you know, we usually think more about in terms of export from the nucleus to the cytoplasm or you know, localization within cells. And I'll talk a little bit more later in the talk about that. Um, but obviously there's, there's links to extracellular export of RNA than, and even RNA binding proteins in extracellular RNA vesicles as well. Um, and obviously mutation, and we now know mutation or alteration of expression of RNA binding proteins has been linked to a whole host of um, different human diseases. So, a number of years ago now, um, NHGRI, you know, one of the NIH institutes, started this, this large collaborative effort to identify, um, they described it as identifying all functional elements in the human and mouse genomes. And you know, at the, at the start of it, they called it ENCODE because it was the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. And then a few years into that, they realized, oh, actually, you know, there's some elements that are not necessarily important in the DNA, but are important in the RNA. And so we joined, and, and you know, I was part of, uh, and I'll talk more about the, the labs in a second, but you know, we joined probably six or seven years ago now to try to take some of the things that they were doing in mapping DNA elements and try to extend that to RNAs as well and try to understand what are the regulatory elements and interactions that occur after the RNA has already been transcribed and you know, regulated by, by RNA binding proteins. So, um, this initially was part of ENCODE, then it was funded through a slightly different mechanism. And I think now we're officially sort of a, a collaborator or somehow of ENCODE um, called ENCORE for RNA elements. So this ENCORE group was really a, you know, a, a real collaboration with um, five labs. So I was a postdoc at, at, you know, previously to, to my current position, I was a postdoc in Gene Yo's lab at UCSD. Um, we were doing looking at what we say in vivo, so in cells, um, RNA targets using ECLIP. Um, I'll talk more about these methods in the next few slides in a little bit more detail, but so we were doing ECLIP to get um, you know, RNA binding protein binding sites in cells. Chris Burgess lab at MIT was using their RNA bind and seek method to look at what the in vitro motifs are for RNA binding proteins. Uh, Brent Gravely's lab at UConn was 
doing knockdown of RNA binding proteins followed by RNA-seq. Um, so look at what gene expression and splicing changes occur you know, when you knock down an RNA binding protein, sort of what's regulated by that protein. For a small number of RBPs, uh, Shengdong Fu's lab at UCSD was actually doing chip seek. Um, I'm gonna talk about that in a second. They were starting to, get a, a, starting to get some glimpses into how chromatin association of RNA binding proteins and co-transcriptional association sort of flows through into RNA processing. Um, and then Eric Luque's lab in Montreal was taking the same antibodies that we used for CLIP and doing immunofluorescence. And the idea was that then we can start to build an understanding of where these RNA binding proteins are in the cell and how that impacts their RNA processing. So most of what I'm gonna talk about today um, was published last year and sort of the, the publication from the first round of this project. Um, there's another round ongoing and there's actually data that's you know, being generated and released as we speak, um, basically for the next year or so. Um, but most of what I'm gonna talk about is, is published in, in this paper in Nature from, from last year. And so a lot of the supplemental data and, and ability to get um, that data is described in that paper. And I'll talk about that um, in this talk. So to give just a very broad sense, um, this, this first effort was something like 1200 data sets for 356 RNA binding proteins. Um, obviously you can't see all the details here. The point is just that there's data for lots of different types of RNA binding proteins. So things that regulate splicing, regulate translation, stability, as well as on the right here, there's a class what we say novel RBPs. So those are some of these proteins that came down when people pulled down you know, poly A RNA and mass spec proteins that were associated with it. So these are putative RNA binding proteins, but nobody really knows what they're doing in terms of regulating RNA processing in humans. Um, and we have a lot of data and, and I'll go through that in, in a couple of slides, but you know, there's some that are more limited. You know, Chris's, uh, Chris Burgess lab has RNA binding seq for a little bit smaller number just because it's harder for them to purify some of these proteins. As I said, chip seq was only done for a small number of nuclear RBPs. Um, the RNA seq and CLIP data sets, you know, we tried to do um, a substantial number of them. So the first question, just sort of where is this data available and how can you get it? Um, so the easiest way is the ENCODE project website. So they have a data coordinating center that's tried to make all this data easily accessible and available to the community. Um, you can search by RNA binding proteins um, and get sort of individual data sets and download them that way by clicking. Um, the figure that I'm showing here is if you search for this ENCORE project, you can pull up sort of any data set that's flagged as associated with ENCORE. Um, and that gets you this, which has links to all the data sets. They also have programmatic ways to access the data. Um, so given an accession ID, you can tell the, you know, you can programmatically pull, here's all the data, here's the BAM files or the FASTQ files for that accession ID. Um, and in the Nature paper, one of the supplemental tables has the accession IDs for all the data sets that we described in that paper. So there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can try to get at all the data that, that we generated. To go through uh, in a little bit more detail, a couple of these things. So, um, the RNA binding seq is really focused on in vitro binding motifs. Um, so this is a method that Chris Burgess lab sort of developed a few years ago. It's sort of a, an extension, a next generation sequencing extension of uh, Celex kind of approaches. So they purify the RNA binding protein um, from usually E. coli, though I believe more recently they've been doing some in mammalian cells as well. Um, but so they purify the RNA binding protein, mix random RNAs with it, um, then pull that down and sequence. And then they computationally can identify what the in vitro motif is for that RNA binding protein. And so if you go on the ENCODE website, you can get you know, both the raw data as well as what they call enrichment values. So basically their identification of these KMERS, these enriched sequences for each of these RNA binding proteins. Um, and they have a separate paper that has more of the individual details for this method um, that was in molecular cell from a, a couple of years ago now. Um, the immunofluorescence, sort of similarly, so Eric Luque's lab um, put a lot of effort into creating an, an ontology and a, a list of defined terms, and then they did immunofluorescence and annotated all of these images. And so you can go and they have a this searchable database, um, it's linked, I believe, from, from the Nature paper as well. Um, you can get, you know, and they have everything from nucleoli to nuclear speckles to RBPs that are mitochondrial. Um, I don't think in this resource we had any that, you know, we're looking at anything that was extracellular, but um, there are some that are on certain membrane associated um, features and stuff like that. Um, and again, you know, all those images are available and the Nature paper has uh, an Excel, you know, one of the supplemental tables has sort of all of those for all the RNA binding proteins in one table. 
Um, ChipSeq, as you, if you're familiar with ChipSeq, you know, that's sort of the standard pipeline here. You know, the idea was that they're trying to pull down these RNA binding proteins that may or may not actually be directly bound to DNA, but may simply be associated with, you know, transcription factors or other chromatin remodeling complexes. Um, and then they can chip seek those because with formaldehyde, you cross link entire complexes together. And so they were starting to use these to explore how if an RNA binding protein is co-transcriptionally associated with certain targets, how that flows into regulation of you know, gene expression or splicing or, or export of the RNAs. Um, again, you know, there's raw data, there's map data, and there's peak calls and even reproducibly peak calls across biological replicates. And that's using sort of the standard chip seek pipeline that ENCODE had developed for you know, all the transcription factor chip seek data that they generated. Uh, Bern Gravius lab, again, was, was doing knockdown of RNA binding proteins. So you know, for these, you know, they're looking both, they have one pipeline to look at gene expression changes and looking at transcription changes. They also have a different pipeline to quantify alternative splicing. So identifying um, isoform usage that's changing um, upon knockdown of an RNA binding protein. Um, again, you know, raw data, so fast cues if you want to reanalyze the data yourself, um, as well as map data. For the knockdown RNA seq data, there's actually a couple of different outputs. And I'm not going to go into the, too much of the details here for time, but the Nature paper has a, a whole supplemental section talking about this. Essentially, each of these experiments was done with a paired control um, in the same batch. So the initial comparison was knockdown versus a paired control. However, in the analysis, we saw that there are both batch effects at the level of you know, sort of batches of doing the experiment, but actually there were, we found ultimately that there were even GC bias, um, GC content biases um, that actually depended on which well of the plate the samples were done in. Um, and so there's actually corrected um, both expression and splicing data that's now available to correct for all of those different um, batch, batch issues for doing things like global analysis of comparing across lots of different RNA binding proteins. And then finally, there's eClip. So eClip is actually a method that we developed as part of this project. Um, so that was published in Nature Methods a few years ago now, um, where we developed an improved method to um, do what's called CLIP or cross-linking and immunoprecipitation. Um, and the idea with CLIP is, as I show here, right? So you have lots of RNA binding proteins in the cell. You wanna take an antibody against the protein of interest, pull it down along with the RNA that it's bound to, um, and then sequence that RNA, make a library of that RNA and sequence it. And then we can identify what the individual binding sites are for each individual RNA binding protein. Um, again, for time, I won't go to the details here. We, we developed this method because the existing CLIP method just didn't scale to the level that we needed for an ENCODE type of project. Um, so we got eClip working and we were able to see, you know, there's, there's obviously clear differences between different RNA binding proteins. And again, you know, we have raw data as well as map data and reproducible peak calls across biological replicates. So to go a little bit into more into the, the CLIP data, just to give you a sense of the kinds of things that you can see there. Um, so there's CLIP data um, from that round of ENCODE for 150 RNA binding proteins. Um, there's, I believe, a bunch more that are coming actually very soon um, that are just finalizing getting QC. Um, but so for that round, there were some that were done in both HEPG2 and KFAS62 cells, as well as a, a smaller number that were, were done in one, but maybe the other cell type didn't work as well or, or didn't, um, didn't replicate. Um, again, you know, in addition to the sort of sequencing data, um, both raw and, and analyzed data, um, there's also things like the antibody validation images. So every antibody, you know, we do IP Westerns. There's also knockdown Westerns to validate that the antibody is actually pulling down the protein that you think it is. Um, so you can go in and, and, you know, judge if you actually believe that the antibody is really specific to the protein that, it, you know, it's supposed to be. Um, this clip data covers lots and lots of different types of RNA binding proteins. So at the peak level, you know, you see RBPs where most of the peaks are in introns. Um, that probably won't surprise you to learn that there tends to be RBPs that are involved in splicing. Um, but then other RBPs, most of the peaks are in through primary TRs or coding sequences or even in uh, non-coding RNAs and things like that. Um, so the peaks were all based on genome mapping. And so we require sort of unique mapping to the genome. And that's what I'm showing here. But we recognize, and, and you know, I think you guys are probably maybe more acutely aware of this than, than many of the um, other areas of RNA processing, but obviously a lot of RNA is not you know, mRNAs, right? And they're introns. Um, and in particular, a lot of RNAs that are expressed in the cell 
are difficult to map to and quantitate mapping to um, because they have lots of copies, they have lots of pseudogenes, you know, their abundance is sort of all over the place. And so we developed an alternative pipeline where we quantify mapping, not uniquely mapping to individual sequences, but quantify mapping to RNA families. Um, so the idea there is that, that we, then we could map to, you know, re identify reads that map to say a yRNA, and maybe they also map to a bunch of yRNA pseudogenes, but that's fine. We can quantify that as mapping to the yRNA family. And so we built that pipeline and we were able to then show that you know, for many of the RNA binding proteins that we, that we profiled, you know, some of them, most of their peaks are in coding sequences or in introns and things like that. Um, but actually many of the RBPs that we were looking at, their dominant signal was coming from, for example, the spliceosomal snRNAs, or even things like um, antisense line elements. Many, uh, but something like six of the RBPs that we did, the dominant clip signal was actually antisense line elements, not sort of any specific um, target. And in the paper, we go through some details there. There's some interesting um, potential RNA processing mechanisms that you can associate with these binding to some of these retro transposable elements in particular. So finally, in the last couple of minutes, I'll, I'll just show a couple of highlights of the kinds of things that we were able to do um, very quickly by integrating some of these different types of data. Um, so one is looking at the localization. So obviously the idea here was, you know, if we know where the RNA binding protein is in the cell, and then we know what its targets are, and then we know what, if you knock it down, what sort of things change, those all should sort of fit together. And so they should sort of start to tell a cohesive story for an RNA binding protein about what it's regulating and where. And so we showed that this basically does work. So if you take, for example, um, clip data and say, well, what are the clip data sets that show the strongest enrichment for mitochondrial RNAs? It turns out that that pulls out RNA binding proteins that then when you look by immunofluorescence tend to be localized to the mitochondria. And so we saw that this works for a number of uh, localization um, patterns that match um, RNA targets that, that are localized to those places. So like the nucleolus, for example, we see RBPs that are localized to nucleolus tend to be things that bind SNOW RNAs or the ribosomal precursors, uh, mitochondria and mitochondrial RNAs. Um, but even things like RBPs that are localized, specifically localized at nuclear speckles tend to be particularly enriched for both um, intronic binding as well as binding to some non-coding RNAs. And so you can start to pull interesting links there um, going forward to, to try to identify how um, different localizations confer with different RNAs that are localized to those sites. Um, similarly, we can try to look at lo uh, regulation mechanisms. Um, so this is sort of the simplest example for splicing. So this is an individual event here um, where this exon is, you can see on the top, it's included in control RNA-seq, um, but is excluded when you knock down RNA binding protein RBFOX2. And then on the bottom, in the clip data, there's a nice binding site for RBFOX2 in the downstream intron of this exon, right? So you can imagine that, you know, that's one event, but if we take all 138 exons that do the same kind of thing, so when you knock down RBFOX2, they're, they're more excluded, um, and you plot the clip data for all of those, you can see already that there's sort of a, a spike in enrichment in this downstream intron where a lot of them seem to have clip peaks in that same region. So you can integrate now across all of those different exons, and you can see, yeah, you know, when you look at exons that are excluded upon RBFOX knockdown in blue, there tends to be a pattern of, of binding in the downstream intron um, close to the fire prime splice site. And so we can build these for lots of different RNA binding proteins and we can see distinct you know, patterns of regulatory activity for these different RNA binding proteins where their binding seems to confer a specific regulation on splicing. So we're just starting to you know, more deeply explore that, but, but this is the kind of thing um, that you can start to put this together from these data sets. And so with that, I'll stop, you know, Obviously this, this work was really primarily done you know, when I was in Gene's lab at UCSD and we had you know, a great group of experimental staff in particular that you know, really generated all the data that I've talked about. Um, we had some great computational staff as well who helped you know, build some of these pipelines and do analysis. Um, the Gravely, Burge, Lupier and Fu labs as well as individual scientists within those labs you know, really led a lot of those um, analyses of, of those different gen data generation and analyses of those different data types. Um, and obviously, I need to thank NHGRI who really, you know, funded this effort and really provided um, the support to this to this group. Um, with that, I'll stop and, and take any questions. And, and thank you guys for uh, for inviting me.